It is 4.59, so we started streaming. You guys are so quiet working on those. <laughs> all right, it is five o'clock. Obviously, you guys are aware you all have a crossword in front of you in the room. Uh, if you successfully fill them out and give them to me, those of you in this room in person, get 20 prairie points. So congratulations. Thanks for coming. Um, today we are going over hearing protection for our actual meeting. We also have Kyle giving a nice presentation on a few things, and we also have Paul here from Minnesota giving an another nice presentation. So, um, we will jump into hearing protection here quick. Uh, so, dangers of noise levels. OSHA states that noise is hazardous if you're exposed to noise over 90 decibels over an eight hour workday. Um, what happens to you if you are exposed to high noise levels? Anybody? What happens to your ears? Hearing loss. Hearing loss. Permanent hearing loss, to be exact. Um, once you lose hearing, you can, there is no way to get hearing back. So once it damages those cells in your ear, it is permanently lost. Um, signs of noise exposure and hearing loss include ringing or humming in your ears after work, trouble hearing someone if they're talking only an arm's length away, and if you experience temporary hearing loss while you are leaving work. So preventing hearing loss, all hearing loss is preventable. Um, chapter 21 in our health and safety manual addresses noise exposure. Um, basically, if there is the possibility of it going over 85 decibels, we are to monitor that. That's typically not anything you guys really work with. Um, but we do offer two types of hearing protection for you guys. What are they? Earmuffs and earplugs. Earmuffs and earplugs, great. Um, so controls for preventing hearing loss we have, again, we have our three tiers here, which we talk about often. We have our engineering controls. Um, some types of those are low noise tools and machinery, maintaining and lubricating equipment, obviously, so it's not racketing together, um, and placing barriers between you guys and the actual source of the noise. Um, administrative controls include operating machinery during lower populated work shifts, so that reduces noise exposure, and limiting the time of workers you guys are exposed to the noise, and providing quiet work areas to take breaks in. PPE, we already talked about. Oops, didn't want to go forward yet. So again, if those two tiers of controls are not enough, that is where PPE comes in as your last line of defense. Um, so we have our earplugs and earmuffs. I have one of each here, great. Um, can somebody come up here and demonstrate how to properly put these on? Jason's closest. Jason has a small head. <laughs> Bo, come on up. <laughs> come on up here and put these on for me. I'll even open them up for you. That was cruel right now. <laughs> Do these as is fit your head. <laughs> Or did you have to adjust them? Or did you have to adjust them? Why? Because <laughs> they were too small. That's not what I asked. Did you have to adjust them? Yes. Okay, great. So, if you put them on and they do not fit correctly, they're obviously not going to protect you well enough. You need to make sure they are adjusted properly so they cover your ears well. Thank you both. Yes, thank you both. Good job, both. 25 per. I have a pair of earplugs here. Brand new, still in the bag. Can somebody come up and demonstrate how to properly insert these? Jason, you're our closest. How about that? <laughs> Go get those small ears Woo. on that small head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can you walk us step by step how to do that? All right. Come stand on over here just no, a you switch. want me in the camera? Just a little. Right there. Right. Right. Bag, it's starting to crack. I can hear it. <laughs> All right. So basically, make sure they're clean, free of dirt. These are brand new, so we don't have to worry too much. Squeeze them down. 
where they will go into your ear canal properly and pull from behind to open up your ear hole and press them in. And do that on both sides. One more step. I'm impressed. Good. So the pulling of the ear, so it basically you pull up mm -hmm. and out. And what that does is straightens that ear canal so you can insert them properly and fully. Second, or the last step that he did not mention as well, is you want to hold it in your ear for 20 to 30 seconds so it has time to expand without pushing itself out. Um, all right. This nice little graphic here shows you kind of different decibels of levels. Um, again, in the 90, anything above 90, so on that right side, 80 to 100, that's where you want to start wearing ear protection. Um, so basically anything louder than a lawnmower or a tractor, loud, noises louder than that. Anything under that is typical things you encounter in a day-to-day -day basis. All right, so pros and cons of each of these. Um, hearing protection is selected based off of an NRR. What that is is a noise reduction rating. So our ear plugs are a 22. Our ear muffs are a 26. These specifically, they'll have different ratings on them. So what that noise rating reduction does is that's the amount of protection that it's going to be reducing the noise decibels that are actually going into your ear. It's not as simple as if it's a 22, it doesn't reduce it by 22 decibels, unfortunately. There's a little more to it. So, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this online, but I'm going to do my best. There's a formula. Isn't that fun? So we have our NRR, noise reduction rating, minus 7. How they came up with that, I don't know. And then they divide it by 2. And that's going to be your decibels that it's actually going to reduce. So, for example, we have our ear plugs. That was a 22, minus 7. I wrote all this down so I could do it fast. Is a 15, and then we're dividing that by 2. So that's giving us a 7.5 decibel noise reduction. Does that make sense? Great. So the higher the number, the better it protects us? Yes. Another example is you can use earplugs and earmuffs together to increase your hearing protection. <coughs> But the difference between the math and that is you're going to take the higher protection value. So these earmuffs are at 26. You're going to do that same math. So I'm not going to write it down. 26 minus 7 divided by 2 equals 9.5. So you're going to take that higher rating, do the math, and then just add 5 decibels of protection. So this would come out to be 14.5 decibels production for you guys if you wore both of these together. Make sense? Cool. Um, earmuffs, we have pros for those. They're easy to, uh, easy to use, easy to wear, and easy to keep clean. Cons, they can be hot and heavy, obviously. These are a large, bulky piece of equipment. They can also interfere with other PPE, like hard hats or things like that. Your earplugs, they work for most noise levels. They're convenient, disposable. You can toss them out, get new ones easily. Cons, they can be difficult to insert correctly, like Jason showed. Um, and they do not protect you if they're not inserted correctly either. All right. And that does it for hearing protection. Now we're all a little more informed on that. Great. Um, we do have some kudos here today as well. Chris Schultz, first on here, um, by Derek Huggins on Sunday, 9620. Fellow driver was broke down and needed an assist. Chris was asked to help out emptying a trailer and proceed with the load to finish it. Without hesitation or complaint, Chris headed to the broke down truck and proceeded to help with the transfer so the truck could be disconnected from the trailer and towed to the yard. He was quick and efficient and, and uh, was happy to help throughout the process. Chris has shown in small ways with his tenure at, P at PFS that he is always willing to help out a fellow driver when it's needed, and his continued dedication to the team is noticed and greatly appreciated. So thank you for that, Chris. Uh, next we have Caleb Hibbs by John Hampton. Uh, Caleb always goes above and beyond in his duties as a driver. He works in the shop on trucks and trailers to help other drivers keep going and earn a living for their families, even if he does not get paid for it in the field or at the shop. Drivers can count on Caleb to help them out. He gives 110% to help other drivers out and keep the company hauling loads or just give them a ride back to the yard so they can pick up their car and go home. No matter what the help is, Caleb is always there to help anyone that needs the help. So thank you for that, Caleb. And last, we have Kane Cloyd by Derek Huckins as well. On Monday 9-7, Kane reported a spill uh, on the Spillman Draw 5, 1, and H when no other driver was found headed in or close to the location. 
Kane was asked to stay on location to help gather up the standing oil in the dike and help clean up the spill. Kane readily agreed to wait until uh, I, as in Derek, arrives so the spill could be cleaned up. Teamwork, patience, and dedication to customer service is what keeps our reputation where it needs to be, and it's great having drivers that strive for excellence in these areas. Thank you, Kane. <coughs> And last, again, we have Chris Schultz. Uh, you guys got that email that asked for the first response to one of Shell's questions. Gets a $25 gift card. Here it is. I don't think he's here today, Chris. No. Um, so come pick that up for me, Chris. Kyle, you're up. What? It's up. It's up. This is all of them? No. This is... So it goes one by one. So this is one. The next slide will be another. Next slide will be another. Okay. Um, learning from incident. Can anybody guess how this happened? You're absolutely right. Driver sitting in the truck on the phone, not paying attention, 10 gallons or 10 barrel spill. Yeah. Cost of that to clean up, $4,200. Plus, we have to pay for the barrels. Yeah, oh, and three feet from a water source. And if we would have hit that water source, then we'd be in more trouble. So, that's one. Do you want to give the time frame? Did you give the time frame that these? Oh, this is in the last five days. <laughs> what did we, we learn from it? If we're learning from it, what did we actually learn from it? Don't sit in your truck. I mean, it's that, it's that simple. Stay near your controls. That, that's a rule and a policy for every producer, us. It's the expectation. You stand by your controls. That's amazing. two major policies that he broke. It's amazing we still talk about. If he, he was at his controls, what, what could have he done? Sure, sure, sure. 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 How big do you think the spill would have been if he would have, would have been there? A lot less. A lot less, huh? Yeah. 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 But this guy's no longer with us, so it should be more. Yeah. Yeah, also consequences of this, Kyle. Yeah, the consequences are the driver has been turned. And then you wonder why we have we the pipeline. We can't. It just can't be tolerated. Not standing by your controls and not and beating a truck. It just can't be tolerated. This one. Driver backed up, hit the Getty box, broke the T-pipe, broke all the anchors. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, shut down the lacked unit for five hours because they had to replace all the stuff. That's downtime we have to pay for. Like, let's just say they're at 10 barrels in an hour. That's a cost that they incurred. They didn't get to sell 10 barrels. Cost for this, about $700 to fix it, but it's the downtime that really makes the producer mad. So how do we prevent this? Get out and look. If he just would have got out and looked, instead of being... I could have, I'm gonna, I can go another six inches. I can go another foot. You can put cones down at the back, and once you hit that cone, you stop. Well, what do you guys do if you have the back and there's no one else there? I'll go to spot you. You know, no. I don't look. I mean, do you have any, typically, like, like Kyle said, I, I take two cones. I walk out with one behind the trailer, set it down, put the other one. The exact same distance behind my drive tires, so that I know that when I get to my drive tires, that's all through here. I went there. You guys have any tips for backing when you don't have a yeah, spot? Yeah, I got one. This one that really kind of plagues me still to this day after I don't know how many years I've been doing this. People are trying, like Jason brought up earlier, people are trying to back up, and if you got room to make a complete circle where you're looking forward, you can turn your truck around, do so. If you can avoid backing, do it. At least that's how things get hit around here. That's how something like that happens. Just take an extra time. Take 
point thirty seconds, make the producers happy, make us safe, and this is avoidable. Yeah. And get just your truck straight before you start back. Yeah. Like it's just I said, this is broad daylight. Like you could have got out. I mean, just get out and look. It, it, I'm with you. I don't understand it either. Some of these, some of these pads out here are big enough to where, instead of making a small turn in a small area, there's enough room to actually go around the pad, reset your placement, get out and look. I'm gonna assume that he probably had to go around the pad to get into position to begin with. So he probably already went around and saw everything that was there to possibly hit, right? Well, this was a water this was water. He's backing up to the water getting oh, box. So he's, he's coming back. So he had to he had to turn right. around. He yeah, and, he, and he backed up to back up. But if he just would have got out and looked or placed the cone down to see how far he could back up, this is completely avoidable. Well, what I noticed on some of these water trailers, I mean, I don't haul water, but I've seen some of our, our water haulers out on location, is my trailer lights up like daylight. Their trailers barely have two lights, one light here. And this is another, broad like, daylight. daylight. <laughs> I'm just talking about people at nighttime, too, you know? Right. But I'm just saying for people at night, I mean... See, so that's even better. They have less light at night, and they don't do this. That's great. Kyle, I've got one more thing to bring up, not on this subject, but it's on a previous subject that you brought up. With winter setting on and it getting colder out, you guys can be in your trucks, but you've got to have your valves shut in and you pump turned off. Truck and turned off. And Shell, Shell actually wants your hoses disconnected and put back on your truck. You guys got to warm up, shut in your valves, disconnect your hose up here on the shell line, make sure everything's safe, and then get in your truck, warm up. I can't. I don't know how many times during the winter time I catch people in their trucks. I guess it's not be doing that. Yep. This one. Hmm. What do you think happened there? What is it? The electrical box That's sitting at an angle. Turn too short. Back to mm -hmm. Back right into it. Now they're backing it. Now they're backing. Backed right into it. It's all by its lonesome. <laughs> On the pad. Get out, and look. get out and look. Know your surroundings. This all happened within the last five days? Yes. Can anybody guess how much one of these new electric panels cost? Three grand, four grand. How much? Uh, it depends on the panel. If you got to worry, get something like that. Let's see, those are... Just give me a roundabout. $10,000. exactly. Just a thousand bucks to fix the box. Does anybody else know how many bolts are running into one of those electric panels? Mm -hmm. Probably 480. 240. A lot of them have even got 480 out there. Yeah. Uh, 480 is a bigger box. Yeah. This one is 10 grand. And we have to replace it. So I'll add it all up in total costs is but roughly. Also shut the well in. <clears throat> yep. Also shut the well in. Oh so God. you have to pay for lost production. Oh, oh my God. Wow. So in the roundabout way, in the last five days, twenty thousand dollars. That comes out of Prairie's pocket. How does a company operate like that? We don't. And these, all of these, are were preventable. Are they seasoned driver? Are they new driver? Both. Both. <laughs> Guys who've been in the oil field a long time. Guys who not very long. One step was not followed. And what were the rules? Employee consequences of this one again? This one. This one we're still it's still under. The one before. Driver's no longer here. And the one before again. Just no longer here. We cannot operate like this. This comes down to you guys. We cannot be watching you guys twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. We have to trust that you guys follow the processes and the rules on location. These are here for a reason, and they're not being followed. 90% of these locations, no reason to back up. Because the Getty boxers are outside the firm, just like the oil trucks. Water trucks can do the same thing. And if they have to pull up further to get to the end of that firm, and get out, look, put a cone out there, Pay attention to where it's at and then back up to your cone. And if you have to do it two or three times, 
keep that process in motion till you get to your your spot to stop to hook up and do what you gotta do. Yeah. Or call somebody, supervisor, <clears throat> come help spot you. That's the biggest thing, especially out in the dark. But Again, this is one of those things that it may take an extra few minutes to do, but in the long run, look at what it's going to save you. And how long did they spend on location after they did that? Hours. Um, I was going to say one uh, thing that I did when I worked at ICE was there was small or a lot of things on the site locations. I bought a, like a big spotlight. If I was entering and I thought it seemed like a maze, I'd get out and bought a spotlight. I agree. This morning I got out in the matrix field. You can see the paints and they're 20 feet in front of me. I got out and instead of just walking up to see where I can park my truck, I walked the entire thing. I want to know exactly where I'm parking my truck, where I'm going to be pulling my truck down. I want to know everything that I can about that location. <coughs> Things like this don't happen. There's a lot of mud on these locations. Some of these dead men are only sitting about that far. Yep. yep. Can't even see them. You run one of those over and you can show the tires, wheels. This happened because a guy was avoiding a dead man. Mm -hmm. And this and this was kind of the example I was talking about earlier. But there's plenty of room to go around the pad and reset. Yep. Plenty of room to go around these <laughs> pads. It's not like these are really tight pads. Where was this at? Ogallala 31. 21. 21. We don't haul we don't haul the oil, it's on a pipeline. I don't think we want to get into no, right, any of that. Just the fact that this could have been prevented by following and adhering to policies and procedures. Yep. And which is part of the Each one of these people chose not to follow the policy and procedure. Yep. This was a conscious choice. So I guess my question is to you guys. How do we motivate everybody to do it the right way? Stop with the shortcuts. You're not gaining anything. Essentially, they're hurting everybody in this room. Yeah, they, they <laughs> made us all look like shit. That, I, I put that to you guys. How do we motivate the, your fellow drivers? The motivation for me is keeping my job and taking a ride. I have a paycheck, you know. Right? Or, you know, it might cost Prairie $20,000, but when Prairie's spending $20,000, nobody's getting raises. Sure. Nobody's getting yeah. Is there any other tools or things that you need from us to help, you know, avoid shortcuts? <clears throat> I don't have them all water in the past. I make mandatory that all water drivers, there's very few Getty boxes that we haul water from. Most of it's backing up to the container. I make that mandatory that the water driver's got to get out for a call. Put it back up. That's one thing. We well, don't hose this flexible. There's no reason you have to back up certain first time. There are some of them they don't have a choice. Yeah, there are. But this is right. But it's putting a cone down. It's taking precaution. And there are some times that I know we've done flowbacks and stuff where we had to back up. Because that was the only way to get enough trucks in there to get the loads out. It could be for anybody. Anybody has got to back up. Yeah. you got to back up. you got to get up with cone loads. So, navigation and Devon have a no backing policy. Yeah, they want to call it. Yeah. And Vermilion is actually on the verge of creating that now. <clears> what's IT corner? Instance. Sierra, what's IT corner? Oh, that was for Robert. Oh. Like the MLT 19, you have to back up. There's no way around that. Have to back up. But it's a straight shot. Once but straight down, I put that to you guys. Email me any responses that you think would be helpful to motivate your fellow employees to do the right thing. Sierra, for the IT corner, can we just make a note? IT corner. I know what you're saying. Can you yeah. Just make a note. Hey guys, please look in your trucks, see if there's any extra tablets or printers. We have, have absolutely no spare working ones right now. Uh, We've had two trucks this week that didn't have anything in them at all. We're trying to figure out why we're a print. These are trucks that were down, so we don't even know how to pinpoint it to be the last one that might have made it missing. So. Okay. Operations. All right. Um, real quick, I'm going to throw in the safety focus phrase as well. It is NRR, noise reduction rating. 
And I think that's it. Okay. Yep. All right, every driver seems to come across this a lot. Thief hatches are being left open again. Um, Karubi brought it to my attention. He found three of them this week alone. I can't remember who it was. DEQ or any of the emissions testing people or anything. They can add fines up to $10,000 per thief hatch that is left open. Yep, BLM. That's the other one I was and thinking of. Track these to who was the last one on site. And we do. Tank. Yep. Especially if there's a ticket left in the box, we know exactly who was the last one. And the last driver one. that is on that location, even if they're not the ones that actually did it, will be held accountable because they left that location with the hatch open or the blowdowns open. Um, we need to make sure and ensure that everybody is doing their jobs and checking these thief hatches. If you guys go up on top, just walk the catwalk, check lids, make sure they're closed. And blowdowns are closed. Yep, the blowdowns need to be closed as well. It's closed and latched. Yep. Bleeder valves, ground lines. Yep, and clean the Getty boxes out. And especially coming up to winter time, the biggest thing that Devin is worried about is cleaning out the load lines. All the sales lines need cleaned out, especially on water. We could have a freeze anytime. But now. so you guys know, when you go, all of our trucks are outfitted with the blowback, but that is not how you clear out a load line. You're supposed to shut it at the valve on the tank, and then you suck it out of the line. So just keep in mind that to shut the valve on your truck and put the air to your blowback is not considered cleaning out the air, cleaning out the lines. No. You've got to suck the line out. Yep, and those pipes are not rated for 110 PSI either, so <laughs> they need to be used caution with that. There was some people out watching today. I passed a convoy of about 20 company trucks out on Walker Creek. Three of them spun around and followed me in the location and sat up on a hill and watched me from start to finish to see how I, how I was going to do it, apparently, I guess. Because as soon as I was done and I racked my hose up, they all three of them turned around and left. I have no idea who they were. <coughs> EHS is out. Yep. With Devin. That's why getting box something else. Yeah. That's why those are so imperative because they're writing them tickets. Well, this because we're not cleaning getting. I know, but they're writing yeah. Devin tickets mm -hmm. for us not cleaning up getting boxes. Mm -hmm. So it all rolls downhill. Mm -hmm. So they're watching us now. If they see yeah. you, they'll spin around and follow you. So how so clean are we supposed to get the Yeti box? I mean, there's some there shouldn't be anything in there. No there's fluids. I mean, no fluids. It would be nice to, to wipe them down and make sure that you know, it's going to stay clean, but we don't want any fluid in them. And there's some I mean, there's, there's gravel in there. Mm -hmm. That's when you get a diaper, you Not get a little bit of a You gotta get that. That's, some out. Plain, that's what I'm saying. Like, look to the left and right. Those are the guys who are who are leaving more work for you. If we all do it, if we all chip in and do it as a team, it's not going to be that bad to clean up. It's whether we can get everybody on the same page to do it together as a team. Yeah, it needs to be done. So I did that at the PPMU the other day when I was there. I cleaned it all out, and then I had to get my bucket over there and scoop the stuff into the bucket because there was so much crap I didn't want to try to sink in the hose. Right? I mean, that's what they have to do. And sometimes you guys are going to come across some that are probably way too much and you're going to need some help. And then you can reach out to the people that The other issue that we're running into is the Hyperion and Matrix fields at the top of the feed patches. There's like one inch of crud in there. If we can, clean those up, guys, because the EQ is not that far. I mean, they come in there too, or they're going to be checking this stuff out. I mean, you have some of those gay boxes that are like three foot deep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you get a little What else we get? We got more. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> I'm supposed to stand here, huh? Yep. All right, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. Some of you I know, some of you know this is the first time. My name is Paul Dunn. I'm the CFO of the company. I work my side very closely with Pat. Uh, Pat and I um, 
were out here yesterday. He had to leave, unfortunately, uh, early this morning, but he asked me to stay. And I've got a couple pieces of information you guys might find uh, might find of interest. So, uh, first of all, why were we out here? Well, contrary to popular opinion, it's not because we're closing. It's not because we're bankrupt. It's not because of any of that. We were out here yesterday to let people know that we've actually hired Alan Welsh's replacement. The gentleman's name is Austin Butt. He comes from Rain for Rent. He's up in Gillette. He'll be here uh, starting next Monday, uh, working with Welsh over the last couple of days of Welsh's tenure so that there's a nice smooth handoff. So we're really, really excited to have Austin in place. And uh, we think that as you guys get to know him, he already has some credentials in the uh, industry coming for Rain for Rent. He knows a lot of the key players. He knows a lot of our customers. We think he's a great addition, and we hope, uh, we hope that uh, you guys enjoy working with him as much as we've enjoyed meeting with him. Uh, the other reason I wanted to talk to you guys is really about the, uh, the rumor. Okay, we were really, Pat and I were both very shocked when we sat down with leadership yesterday, and the first thing they heard is, hey, we thought we, you were here to shut us down. Heard the doors were closing, heard you were selling off the pilot, and that uh, we're going out of business. Here to tell you, there ain't nothing further from the truth. That is a bunch of bullshit. <coughs> Excuse my language, but that's the way it is. Our company has done great. You guys have done a fantastic job. Worst downturn in our industry maybe ever, and we're doing great things. We're not out of the woods, not by no stretch, not even close, okay? But we are a long way away from going bankrupt or selling out. Pat Hughes is in this for the long term. So where do we need from you? Right now, we don't need pay cuts. We don't need any of that crap. What we need to do are some of the things that you heard from the team here earlier today. We cannot afford to spend $20,000 a week fixing things that could have been fixed. That's money that could go to pay for parts. That's money that could go to pay for fuel. That's money that could go into our benefits, okay? That's money that's coming out of each and every one of your pocket, one way, shape, or another. So when we're doing things like that, we're just letting people rob us, okay? When we, take, when we don't clean Getty boxes, when we don't represent ourselves the best, we give our customers a reason to look for other players, okay? Each and every one of you knows somebody else from a competitor that's driving. They are out there, and they are desperate, okay? They're not nearly in as good a shape as we are. And we're seeing prices for water, for hourly services, and for crude oil hauling that are falling through the floor. Right now, because of all the work that you guys have done to get us to this point, we can compete. We're going to match them. We're going low. That's what it takes. We're going to go low. And for the foreseeable future, we're going low without impacting anybody else's pay. But that means we've got to be the, cust uh, the company that our customers <coughs> think about. If we come in a penny or two pennies higher up per barrel, we want the customer to say, Prairie Field Services is worth every single penny. We'll pay it because they do that good a job when they're on our site. So I'm here to tell you, I'm more than glad to take any questions. I think uh, one of the best barometers you can use is in the shop. Uh, when I was here six months ago in March, I said everything is, you know, looking better. And the shop people were the first ones to tell me, yeah, then how come I can't buy any parts? Well, we've gone a long way to improve our relationship with our vendors. We've got just a couple that are old. Everybody else is current. We're paying our bills. Uh, all of our benefits are being funded. Everything is in, in good shape. Not a lot of room for errors. Not a lot of room for uh, paying $20,000 for uh, broken fixtures. But we're fine. Okay? You guys keep doing what you do to the level that you do it. We're going to get through this. We're going to be fine. And Pat Hughes is not going to sell this company for anything because he absolutely loves you guys. He's so proud of what you do every single day. He's proud to say he's the owner of Prairie Field Services. With that, I'm going to shut up. I'm going to open it up for any questions you guys have. <clears throat> Nothing? All right. Well done. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Okay. We just give it a second for online. It's still trying to catch up here. Hopefully, there's nothing online. But in the meantime, for anybody sitting in this room, if you guys haven't filled out that employee summary, it's also titled New Hire Summary. Please do that. I've sent it out like three times, and yet I've only gotten like an eighth of the people's summaries back. I do need that. We're switching systems. We're switching from ADP to a system called Paycor. 
And so we're trying to make sure that all information is updated. That's the reason I need it. It's not because I just want to torture you guys or I want more work for myself. I really do need that so we can make sure that we have the most current updated stuff. I also sent out emails yesterday um, to some people about dependent social security numbers. So again, make sure you're checking your emails. Make sure um, that you are responding to those. I have some dependents in there that I do not have social security numbers for. So I sent you an email. I need you to get those and then call me with them, please, so we can get those updated. I know some of you sitting in this room. I've sent emails too that I need social security numbers for. So I'll get it. <laughs> uh, we know you don't have one. Go. <laughs> so check your emails again, always, repetitively, daily. Not while you're driving or loading. Yeah, that, that too. Well, the only other thing is the crossword puzzles that Sierra had. Go make a big stack of them for me so I can give them to her. Yeah, make sure your names are on. Yeah, put your names on. But appreciate you coming in. Appreciate your time, Paul. And thanks, everybody, for a good, good week. <laughs>